the kids and the and the uh, and the teachers. So let's move move forward. Premier Doug Ford trying to calm anxiety, saying school boards are ready as the Toronto District School Board looks at making class sizes smaller and masks mandatory. The board held special meetings today on possible changes for the school year, looking at changing class sizes in parts of the city most affected by COVID-19 and using up money from its rainy day fund. Lorenda Redekop joins us live now with more on this. And Lorenda, the TDSB just voted on mandatory masks in the classroom. That's right, Dwight, and that just came in the last hour here. So they will be mandatory at the TDSB for all students and staff. And originally, the plan was that they were only going to be mandatory for grades four and up. The TDSB decided to go ahead with that change, and it's saying that because in uh, City of Toronto properties, for example, you have to go inside with a mask for ages two and up. And so it wanted to make this mandatory for everyone who can wear wear a mask. So that's the big news as well. It approved a plan that had been talked about in an initial meeting this morning. And so changes, classes will be kept smallest in areas most affected by COVID-19 here in this city. The Economic Development Committee recommended this plan class sizes in those most at-risk areas would be held to a maximum of 15 students in kindergarten, up to 20 students for the other elementary grades. In other parts of the city, schools would have a maximum of 26 students in kindergarten, 20 for grades 1 to 3, and 27 for grades 4 to 8. To do this, the board would take $29.5 million from the reserve fund, increasing the deficit to 2% to add 366 more teachers. The Premier is in favour of dipping into those reserves. The reserves are there for the rainy day fund and no, I haven't seen a storm like this in, in quite some time in my lifetime. So let's use the reserves and hire more teachers and, and uh, you know, we, we all work together. We're going to get through this. Ford says that he understands the anxiety that parents and teachers are feeling right now, but he's confident that this can be done, and he compared teachers to other emergency workers. Look at the truck drivers. Look at our great police officers, firefighters, EMS. Uh, like, everyone stepped up. Every single person in this country has stepped up uh, for the call of duty, per se. And, you know, now I'm asking the, the teachers' union. Now it's your turn. Now, parents are going to be getting their turn soon to give their thoughts. They're going to be sent another survey asking, do you expect to send your kids to school or keep them at home for remote learning? And the board is going to give three days for parents to answer this survey from August 26th to 29th. It says that with school just around the corner, it can't wait any longer. And we did hear in the meeting this afternoon in terms of when kids could be coming back to school. Uh, we heard that it is expected to likely be on September 15th, but with kids going staggered days, not all kids would be going on that first day and it would happen over two to three days and it would be the same situation for kids who choose to, to learn at home. Dwight? Time is running out. Thank you, Lorenda. Six people were injured in three separate shootings in the span of just two hours last night. Now, the police union is pointing out Toronto is on track to beat last year's record number of shootings. Greg Ross has more. Why the shooting? Where did get it gone from? This man lives near Jane in Shoreham, just steps from another shooting yesterday. It happened right outside this woman's door. I came out and I saw a policeman, and there's a guy on the floor. Bleeding. There were three men who suffered gunshot wounds, all taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. This was just one of three shootings in the area yesterday. In all, six people were injured, and they all happened between 6.15 and 7.45 yesterday evening. Very brazen daylight shootings. Um, it shows clear disregard for the people around. Brian Callanan is the interim president of the Toronto Police Association. He says yesterday's shootings bring the total this year to 274 in Toronto. That's one ahead of where we were at this same time last year. If our numbers continue on, Greg, as they are now, um, it, this is going to be an all-time high for the shooting incidents in the city of Toronto. 
Kalanen says it's possible the COVID-19 pandemic has played a role, particularly because the borders have been closed for so long. There is a potential impact on the drugs and guns coming up to Canada from the United States, uh, and that could be a, a determining factor for sure. Do you think this pandemic has played any role in those numbers still trending upwards? Those issues are ongoing, pandemic or no pandemic. I, I don't think the pandemic is, is uh, you know, uh, to blame for this. Paul Bailey is the principal of a social planning firm called Revive. He points to the fact that the shootings have been on an upward trend for the past five years. Both Bailey and Kalanen agree that funding is needed to fix the problem, but they don't agree on how it should be spent. Our ask here is to ensure that um, we have continuous funding, we have adequate resources for our officers. I think if we're willing to spend a billion dollars on policing and, and, you know, not to mention other parts of the criminal justice system, prisons, courts, et cetera, why are you willing to make that same level of investment in upstream investments in, in communities? Bailey says fixing the problem means getting to the root of it instead of just policing it. Public health approach, uh, coordinated action, investment upstream in, in, in communities. Why aren't we making the investments that we know will work? And while he says there have been programs funded by all levels of government, he doesn't think any of them go far enough. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. Three people were taken to hospital with minor injuries following a multi-vehicle collision in North York this afternoon. The crash occurred near Keelan Shepherd at around 4 p.m. Police say four vehicles were involved in the collision and a pedestrian was also struck. Eastbound Shepherd is closed between Sentinel Road and Keel and northbound Keel is shut down between Wycombe Road and Shepherd. Police are urging drivers to avoid the area for now. The federal and provincial governments have convinced manufacturer 3M to start making N95 respirator masks here in Ontario. Now the masks will be made at 3M's Brockville plant. An official announcement is expected tomorrow with both Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Ford in Brockville. The agreement will mean Canada will now have a domestic supply of personal protective equipment. The two levels of government and 3M will invest some $70 million to increase production capacity at the plant. The goal is to begin producing masks there by 2021. The federal government has announced new measures to help Canadians through the COVID-19 crisis. It is extending the Canada Emergency Response Benefit for another four weeks and revamping unemployment, sorry, employment insurance to allow more people to receive emergency aid. But this new set of benefits comes with a hefty price tag, $37 billion. David Cochran has more details now from Ottawa. Reopening is happening, rehiring is too, but not at a speed or scale for millions of unemployed Canadians whose support benefits are set to run out at the end of August. We're doing our very best to support all Canadian workers and leave no one behind. So today, another pandemic lifeline. The Canada Emergency Response Benefit will be extended by another four weeks. Then the country will transition to a simplified version of employment insurance. It will be easier to qualify with a minimum benefit of $400 a week for at least 26 weeks. EI is critical to our economy. Canadians rely on this program to get through difficult times when they've lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Self-employed workers and workers not eligible for EI will get similar benefits through a new temporary program. So will people who can't work because they have to care for a child under 12 who can't go to school or daycare. And there's two weeks of paid leave for people who get sick or have to isolate. Canadians won't just transition from one benefits program to another, they will also shift to a new set of expectations. The CERB paid people to stay home, not work, and flatten the curve. But employment insurance requires people to look for work, as Canada tries to return to as close to normal as possible. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Durham police have released images of a man charged in a brutal random attack on a 50-year-old 50 50-year-old 50 woman in Whitby. The suspect was arrested last Thursday in Ottawa. Kelda Ewan is live in Whitby on the story for us tonight. And Kelda, police are trying to find out if there are any more victims. 
Well, Dwight, yeah, this was a completely random attack. So Durham police hope by releasing these photos today, if there are uh, more potential victims, that they will come forward. Now, I am on Taunton Road near Anderson Street, and this is the area where the victim, Kimberly Black, was jogging uh, uh, late July when she was viciously attacked by this suspect. Now, police today released these two photos of... Uh, of the suspect, his name is Dorian Francis. Uh, he remains in that he remains in custody, awaiting a bail hearing. Now he is 21. Anthony Dorian Francis. He's 21 years old, facing charges of attempted murder, aggravated assault, and aggravated sexual assault. A police say he was not known to them, and he lived in Ottawa actually until this past March when he moved here to Whitby. Uh, they also say he has spent some time in Burlington, Ontario. Now, police had previously released surveillance video showing a suspect following Black the day, the evening she was attacked. They said tips poured in after they released this footage to the public, which helped them help lead them to Dorian Francis's arrest last Thursday in Ottawa with the help of Ottawa police. Now, Kimberly Black had gone out for her nightly jog around 8 p.m. back on July 28th, and she never returned so family contacted police and police searched overnight, but it was only the next morning that they found her at a nearby creek with serious injuries. A black did not know her attacker. Durham, Pol Durham police said that other potential victims should contact them immediately, um, either them or Crime Stoppers. Uh, here is Detective Jill Locke, who I spoke with earlier. We have no connection and no links to any other victims. We released those pictures today to ensure that if there are other people out there that they can come forward. So we have nothing at this point. I think um, a lot of people have said to me that they wanted to see his face and to know who he was and uh, that they'll feel better once they see the pictures. Now, as mentioned, Dorian Francis, he remains in custody. Uh, Detective Jill Locke says the bail hearing has not yet been set. As I mentioned, as for Black, uh, she remains in hospital. She is still recovering in hospital, but her family has said that she is getting better every day. Um, there is also a GoFundMe page set up for her that has so far raised over $100,000. There is also a walk that will be happening in the town of Coburg this coming Saturday to raise money for her recovery. Dwight. Yeah, just a scary, scary incident. Thank you, Kelda. Homicide detectives are investigating after three suspicious deaths in Mississauga. The men, all in their late 20s, were found in a condo yesterday afternoon. Peel police say drugs and alcohol were found in the unit with them. Investigators are concerned that the substances may have been laced with a dangerous substance. The coroner has determined that the deaths were suspicious. A fourth man was sent to hospital and is now cooperating with police. The city's deadly overdose crisis hit new heights this summer with more than two dozen deaths in July alone. Now Toronto is set to get its first safe supply sites, giving clients access to regulated opioids instead of drugs off the streets. The shift is thanks to more than a million dollars in new federal funding. Lauren Pelly has the details. We are proud to provide safer supply as a proactive public health response to an alarming public health crisis. Angela Robertson heads a Parkdale Harm Reduction Centre, now the recipient of half a million dollars in federal funding to supply clients with safe drugs. We see safer opiate supply as a necessary extension of the harm reduction work that we do at this centre and that we've been doing for decades. A basic kit. The goal is to provide easier access to prescription opioids alongside existing services like safe injection sites. Ottawa is handing several Toronto agencies one and a half million dollars in total to get more of those services up and running. Regions across the country are struggling with historic rates of drug overdoses. These challenges have obviously been exacerbated during the COVID-19 outbreak. Throughout much of this year, deadly suspected opioid overdose calls received by Toronto paramedics kept rising hitting a grim new record of 27 deaths in July. These are preventable deaths, and we're only going to be able to stop these deaths if we have a public health approach. Adding safe supply sites to that approach marks a first for Toronto. The sites will be providing prescriptions for hydromorphone that drug users can get filled at a pharmacy. The sites are also targeting existing clients of organizations already working with drug users, not the broader public. 
The agencies behind this project are hoping to launch at least five sites in different areas of the city, spaces where drug users can go and get prescriptions for legal regulated opioids. They're also hoping to do community outreach, bringing these safe supply services to the streets where they say drug users need it most. People like Akia Munga. A safe supply is something that is life changing. And they said potentially life saving. To be honest, it's it's something that should have happened a long time ago. That's something both officials and advocates now agree on. This is good news, but we are late in our response. And that many of these deaths, these thousands of deaths, could have been prevented by faster action. This first round of funding is also a bit of a test run, just for a pilot project lasting less than a year. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. He is accused of renting luxury homes in the GTA and turning them into rooming houses, subleasing them to as many as 20 people. Now a Markham man is facing a slew of fraud charges. CBC Toronto has learned at least 11 GTA landlords were victimized and as Farah Morelli tells us, some homeowners are still trying to evict him. After weeks of repairs, this couple's home is almost back to normal. In April, they rented it to a man named Arif Saeed. But within a week, neighbors alerted them to these rental ads on Kijiji that showed their four-bedroom home divided up into multiple units. He changed it to the 14 rooms with the curtain, walls. Unbelievable, just unbelievable how fast they did it. The couple alleges Saeed stopped paying them rent but collected as much as 10 grand a month from his tenants. Then there were the damages. We have a carpet in the basement. It was... Uh, fully wet, soaking in ketchup and beer. And someone decided to change the walk-in closet to a birdhouse. They also stole the furniture and stole the, um, the fridge. The couple did check Saeed's references. The problem is he allegedly spelled his name differently. And so his past brushes with authorities went undetected. This June, York Regional Police charged him with 11 counts of fraud. In all, CBC News has confirmed 11 GTA landlords are alleged victims of Saeed. Despite his charges, many are still trying to evict him. John Davies has gone to the LTB twice to try to evict Saeed, but said the cases were tossed on procedural technicalities. The bureaucratic details were um, trumped any, any discussion about the illegal use of the house. The board really doesn't look at whether charges have been laid, uh, whether convictions have been registered. They will deal with What's on the notices of termination? Extremely rigid. Oh, hi. Could I speak to Mr. Arif Adnan Syed? Uh, yes, speaking. We reached Saeed by phone. He agreed to an interview. Okay, great. So we'll speak to you thank for you. an interview tomorrow morning. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Saeed. Around 90 minutes later, he wrote us to say his lawyer had advised him not to speak to us, but added he has evidence the allegations are wrong. This couple considers themselves lucky to have evicted Saeed, but say they're done with being landlords. We don't want to risk it with another tenant. Farah Morelli, CBC News, Toronto. Remember, if you have a story you would like us to look into, send us an email, torontotips at cbc.ca. Nick said the temperature was going to rise, and guess what, Nick? It did. You were right, buddy. That's pretty <laughs> yeah, usual. I, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> um, yeah, we hit uh, 28 degrees, uh, or, or rather 27 degrees earlier on, uh, with the Humidex uh, feeling just into the 30s. That's that southerly wind that we were talking about. Right now sitting at 26 degrees. Uh, still a southerly breeze. That's going to sort of peter out as we head through tonight and then tomorrow picking up once more. Uh, lots in the way of sunshine right now. We were tracking this system that's up to the north. Uh, it's really not going to um, affect us except that as it slides through tomorrow um, the bulk of the rain is actually going to be to the east of us but I think we are going to trigger off a few showers around the GTA so we've got about a 40 percent chance of seeing showers in your neighborhood tomorrow highs to 28 degrees humidex to about 34 more on that coming up in just a bit thanks Nick you bet the weather is brought to you by train the most reliable heating and cooling brand we test so it runs it's hard to stop a train. 
We are hearing directly from Raptors President Masai Ujiri today. After new video was released showing an Oakland officer shove him twice after Toronto won the NBA championship last year. In a statement, he says, quote, the video sadly demonstrates how horribly I was treated by a law enforcement officer last year in the midst of my team, the Toronto Raptors, winning its first world championship. I was reminded in that moment that despite all of my hard work and success, there are some people, including those who are supposed to protect us, who will always and only see me as something that is unworthy of respectful engagement. And there's only one indisputable reason why that is the case, because I am black. What saddens me most about this ordeal is that the only reason why I am getting the justice I deserve in this moment is because of my success. Because I'm the president of an NBA team, I had access to resources that ensured I could demand and fight for my justice. So many of my brothers and sisters haven't had, don't have, and won't have the same access to resources that assured my justice. And that's why black lives matter. When we come back, we speak to a parent who is saying no to sending their children back to school and yes to a learning pod. Do you get a, a whole year? It's almost like a gift. If we wanted to spin this in a positive light, you have a year, if you can afford a learning pod, to pick your programming, find the right teacher, do something really different.
Premier Doug Ford was at OPP headquarters in Orillia today to announce the hiring of 200 additional officers in response to a sweeping report on mental health, stress and suicides in the service. That's 200 more boots on the ground. These new officers will be deployed to areas of greatest need across the province. They'll protect our communities and we will keep looking out for our officers just as they do as they look out for us each and every day. Together, we're making changes to sustain a healthy, inclusive, resilient and high-performing OPP. Our members and our communities deserve nothing less. The hiring will cost the province $25 million. It builds on the $2.6 million investment announced in April to hire new OPP psychologists and other mental health professionals. The uncertainty around the start of the school year has led some parents to consider other education options for their children. Some are looking at what's called learning pods, where a small number of students are taught together outside of a school environment. Parents pay for the lessons and can cost hundreds of dollars per week per child. Marvel Tarouk spoke with one mother who's trying to organize a pod for her seven-year-old daughter. Yeah, we've all been living in this really stressful pandemic period, and I. I'm kind of excited about the idea of um, putting together programming that's going to look and feel completely different for a year. Like the attention is always to return to school. Would never see myself springing up a homeschool program before this happened, but here we are. So if we can put something together that incorporates outdoor education and art and activities and gymnastics, and I think there's a lot that can be done in that situation that makes it fun and and really a good experience for the kids. With the pod, I think you've got less risk for that from the health point of view, um, but also more abilities to customize to what the kids need and do something really different. I just want to make reference to the flapping of the tent that we're hearing because, I mean, this could very well be one of the spaces um, that your daughter and whoever else ends up in her pod uses. Yeah, the idea is to have the kids outside as much as possible and um, this would be a setup for them to use. Um, and then also if we had to move indoors, I've been going around the neighborhood looking at storefronts for rent and also places like Pilates and yoga studios to see if people want to rent space that they're not using because they can't have classes right now. You are a single mom. You've been trying to be the teacher and everything else through all of this. How, how are you doing this? Uh, most parents out there are feeling this extra pressure, especially the women. Um, and I'm worried about what this means for women in the workplace and um, how it's affecting them when they should be working. The longer this goes on, the harder it is to really make sure you're going to be kicking butt at your job, which is, you know, what I'm trying to do. Um, and that's why the pod piece came up, because I think that's the route that um, if things are very uncertain, that's the route that I think presents the most certainty. The government really needs to take this seriously. It's a women's issue and it's an economic issue because, uh, you know, here I am talking about running a pod and, and my daughter may or may not be in one, but I can afford to go that route, you know, sharing it with my ex-husband and with other parents. But what about the moms and other parents that are not able to afford that? It becomes a greater and greater problem for women and parents. I guess if you had the ear of the province, which has to approve of all of the school board's plans, um, what would be your, your biggest message to them? I think blaming the teachers' unions is a terrible idea. It completely ignores the fact that parents don't want to be looking for a second course of action. Any parent that I've talked to wants to send their kids to school. Any teacher that I talk to wants to be in school, but nobody is happy about sending our kids to school or showing up to work in a school that is not taking the right precautions as outlined by public health and that's the kids study. And I think it's the Ford government has, I think they came in strong to dealing with the issues in this pandemic and a lot of non-conservatives like myself were pleased with how Doug Ford was reacting to certain problems. I think he's completely blown it in this respect. Strong words there. Does the GTA need another major east-west highway?
That's an outdated view of planning. It's just trying to, to, to catch up to the demand that has already existed. This highway is not being built uh, on speculation. We look at the issue of Highway 413 next. government signaled that it would be moving ahead with plans to build a new highway through the western part of the GTA. Now, the plan was scrapped by the Liberal government under Kathleen Wynne two years ago, but is now back on the fast track. And as Philip Lee Shonick tells us, a report released today by an environmental group says the billions spent won't decrease congestion. If this looks bad now, imagine traffic in the next few decades when the population of the greater Toronto area grows to more than 13 million. It's estimated that traffic congestion already costs the region $6 billion annually. To fix it, the Doug Ford government has not only resurrected a highway rejected by the previous Liberal government, it's fast-tracked it. Highway 413 would run from Highway 401 near Milton in the west to Highway 400 near Kleinberg in the east. Today, the group Environmental Defense called for the plan that's been brought back from the dead to be buried for good. I think it's an outdated view of planning that justifies this highway, that we think, you know, we can just continue to sprawl outward to have more, you know, large single family 
uh, homes in a suburban kind of cul-de-sac model connected by highways. Uh, we just can't continue to grow that way. He says the new toll highway would do little to ease congestion and mean more subdivisions on what's supposed to be protected greenbelt land. Instead, the money should be spent on more densely populated, walkable communities and public transit. But this transportation infrastructure and urban planning expert says even with public transit, this expansion of the highway network is overdue. It's just trying to, to, to catch up to the demand that has already existed. This highway is not being built uh, on speculation. If you look at how Toronto has grown in the last 30 years, you would see that places that were not urbanized have already been urbanized. In a statement, the province insists the 413 will reduce travel times and that it's working with the Greenbelt Transportation Advisory Group to protect sensitive land. Still, environmental defense says the accelerated plan calls for building over sensitive ecosystems like rivers and streams to proceed before the environmental assessment is complete. And a government advisory group, the Greenbelt Council, also opposes the highway. Philip Lee Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. The Ontario government is providing half a million dollars to retrain veterans for jobs in the IT and tech sector. When these soldiers, sailors, airmen and women retire from active service, they absolutely deserve our gratitude. And a great way to show our appreciation is to make sure their remarkable skills and talents are utilized when they transition into new civilian careers. Helping veterans find good jobs shows our service members that we have their back. The Soldiers in Tech program is providing 12-week boot camps to train veterans to enter junior web developer positions. The program aims to address both the difficulties faced by veterans in re-entering the workforce and the shortage of skilled workers in the tech sector. The first veterans started their training this week. Lebanon Strong is a relief campaign in the GTA hoping to help the people in Beirut who were affected by the blast. The group has been collecting food, clothing and medical supplies and is shipping them to Lebanon. So far, the group has filled one 40-foot container with goods and is hoping it will be the first of many. So the Lebanon Strong campaign need is we're people helping people. We're collecting donations from Canadian people and sending it to Lebanon to smaller charities. Um, it's one container at a time, uh, food, PPE uh, equipment, uh, medical equipment. So we've got Lebanese, non-Lebanese, everybody's coming together um, as a Canadian, people helping people. So a lot of people are donating. So this is the 20 foot container going to Lebanon. It's all medical relief goods donated by the great doctor Brad and the Rotary Club of Canada, various locations. Uh, we're putting this together. We're going to be sending it to an NGO in Lebanon who will be doing the distribution to the various doctors in dire need. This will be railed uh, to Halifax. From Halifax, it will connect to Europe. Europe, it will connect to Lebanon. So 27 days generally, right? Yes, to get 27 to days. We have wheelchairs, we have braces, we have gauze, band-aids, we have diapers for adults, walkers, crutches. We have donations to help the hospital. They have nothing. We have pillows, we have blankets for the ambulances. We need as much as we can to help the people in Lebanon. The hospitals are, some of them were blasted. So we're collecting and our goal is to send 30 containers in three months to various NGOs, small ones to get to the remote areas for the people in need. 4,000 people were quite severely injured. All of those wounds, A, need to be dressed acutely and lavaged and washed out. But then other wounds, you have to continue those dressings. Um, and sometimes those will take a long time, months to heal. And so some of the things that we're sending are just dressing things, saline things that you need to properly wash wounds out. Well, some people are emailing us from Lebanon. We're getting calls. Please, my, my father-in-law doesn't have a wheelchair. Please send me a walker. Uh, please help this family. So that's why this campaign came together. We're people in Canada helping people in Lebanon. We're going to help them as much as we can with the essential needs. There's a lot of mistrust in Lebanon on the ground. I just had a conversation today with people in Lebanon. We are going to do our best to go through charities that are um, approved. And even if we have to go down to Lebanon to make sure the, the, the donations from Canadian people get to the Lebanese, we want to do that. We're going to do that.
It's just incredible that when disaster strikes around this planet, how mm -hmm. Canadians always come together to help, Nick. I know. I know. It makes us proud for sure. Mm -hmm. It definitely does. Uh, wonderful story. Um, Earlier on, we were talking about the weather starting to heat up a little bit, and uh, it's going to continue as we head into the weekend. Uh, we do have the risk for some isolated showers as we head through tomorrow, uh, but then Saturday, great start to the weekend as well. Sunny Saturday, and the forecast and humidity is rising. Here's a look at current temperatures sitting at 26 degrees right now in the city of uh, Toronto. Uh, it was 27 earlier on with the Humidex was feeling closer to about 30. Now that humidity is going to continue to rise. So we're looking at Humidex values in the mid 30s by the time we hit tomorrow and into the weekend as well. Now, I, I mentioned the system that's moving off to the east and the north of us, so areas around cottage country seeing some showers or isolated showers anyway. As it sweeps across, what we're expecting to see is that rain still staying to the north and to the uh, east of us. However, it is going to trigger off a few afternoon showers. We're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of after 2 p.m. to about 4 p.m. We'll see some showers likely to the east end of the GTA, and then it looks like we may see some scattered showers push across the city through through the afternoon hours. So put about a 40% chance of seeing showers in your neighborhood. Uh, we are going to see them popping up, but whether they actually make it right across the GTA, uh, we'll have to wait and see for tomorrow. Uh, as we head into Saturday, though, good sunshine in the forecast. Sunday, again, we've got a few isolated or scattered showers uh, as we head towards sort of middle of Sunday and into Monday. We'll get to that in the long range forecast. For now, though, warmer night tonight at 17 degrees. Uh, this in large part due not just to the heat, but the humidity as well that's starting to move in. As we head through tomorrow, the risk for an isolated thunderstorm uh, or at least a shower. Highs to 28. Humidex values tomorrow, though, uh, heading up to about 34 in the city of Toronto. And it's going to continue to climb. By Saturday, Humidex of about 35. Sunday and Monday, the risk for isolated showers. I do think we're going to see them, but they'll be isolated. So that's why we've got a 40% chance there. Uh, Humidex values stay close to 30 up until Monday, and then a bit of a drop in our temperatures by Tuesday. Thank you, Nick. You bet. The ticket is set as the Democratic Party in the U.S. looks to regain the White House. Last night, Kamala Harris made history when she officially became the party's vice presidential candidate. I accept your nomination for vice president of the United States of America. Harris, a senator from California, is the first woman of color to accept a major party nomination. In her acceptance speech, she spoke about her mother, who came to the U.S. from India as a university student. Harris also talked about her vision of America as a country where all are welcome and everyone can find a home. Former White House aide Steve Bannon has been arrested. The high-profile advisor to U.S. President Donald Trump is facing fraud and money laundering charges. Bannon is accused of misusing donations that were supposed to go towards a border wall with Mexico. Bannon is widely credited with guiding the campaign that got Trump elected. He's also seen as the architect of the administration's immigration policy. Bannon helped create a nonprofit organization to fundraise for Trump's plan for a wall along the border with Mexico. All of the money was supposed to go to the construction effort, but prosecutors say Bannon took more than a million dollars to pay others and cover his own lavish expenses. When we come back, a final look at your forecast, plus how a Toronto artist is illustrating the importance of masks during the pandemic. I've always been interested in art. I've been doing acrylic paintings for the past five years, but recently I started to do cartoons. And I believe that they can be just as effective, if not more effective, than words.
While finishing her last few months of kinesiology and health sciences at York University, Elnaz Hidari decided to put her artistic skills to work by illustrating some cartoons with a very important message during this time. Hi, my name is Elnaz Hidari, and these are my illustrations on the importance of wearing masks during the COVID-19 pandemic. I just finished my fourth year of university. I go to York University and I study uh, kinesiology and health sciences. I've always been interested in art. I've been doing acrylic paintings for the past five years, but recently I started to do cartoons. And I believe that they can be just as effective, if not more effective than words. And um, they're powerful in the way that they can invoke ev emotion in people and help them remember a situation more. So I use that and I I drew cartoons about like for example the importance of wearing masks and um, how it can it can save you and your community and I try to make it a little light I try to make it a little um, humorous as well as informative there's been a lot of different sides on masks there's been a lot of debate at first um, some people were saying that they might not be so effective but now they're saying that they're definitely effective and they're saying that it's mandatory now and um, I just thought I would illustrate that again as a student of health myself and as an artist, I thought I would put that together and kind of use my talent to <laughs> convey that information. The pandemic has put a hold on many people's plans, but what if your plan was to compete in the Olympics? I found out um, I wish I knew more information from Team Canada, just like what's, what's gonna happen moving forward. Like is the Olympics canceled until like 2024 or is it? You wanna meet this young man, long distance runner, Justin Knight was on a roll smashing records. I speak to him about his athletic journey and the frustration of not being back on the track in the Olympics next.
Runner Justin Knight was peaking at the perfect time when COVID put a stop to everything. He had just shattered the Canadian indoor record set way back in 1986 for the 1500 meters. He was the third fastest in the world and rising heading into an Olympic year. Now those Olympic dreams are on hold and he has his sights set on next summer. Justin joins us now to talk about what this year has been like and what is ahead for him. First of all, thank you for joining us and welcome home. We understand that you are quarantining because you just came back from the States. You know, Justin, you put in so much work to get to that point to try to accomplish your Olympic dream. Take us back to that point when you heard the Olympics were postponed. How did you deal with that emotionally? Oh my gosh, well thank you, first of all, thank you Mr. Drummond for having me here. Uh, I appreciate you guys reaching out and talking to the athletes and you know, in times like these when we have our Olympics taken away from us, uh, it's really nice to keep doing interviews like this. And uh, when I first heard out, or when I first heard about uh, the Olympics being canceled, I was astonished. I honestly didn't believe what I heard. At that point, the pandemic was pretty early and there was not too much information. I think there was enough, but um, you know, for people like me that weren't watching the news as avidly, uh, we didn't know how serious that it was going to be and how long it would last for. And um, I think I was okay with the decision. I think just when I found out, um, I wish I knew more information from Team Canada, just like what's, what's going to happen moving forward. Like, is the Olympics canceled until like 2024 or is it <laughs> going to happen next year? And, uh, you know, luckily it worked out in the best way possible. Hopefully we will have it sooner than later. And now with no <laughs> Team Canada training, how are you doing this? Are you training by yourself due to COVID now? Yeah, so uh, I train by myself. Usually, as you know, I, I work out in the States. I'm part of the Reebok Boston Track Club. And uh, I've always been the type of person that I seek guidance from whoever, <laughs> anybody, whether you're a coach, athlete, um, whether you're in the NCAA or you're already a pro, like I'll always try to seek advice from uh, a lot of my peers. And this is just something that nobody's been through. So um, we've been kind of learning on the fly and everybody's been trying to make the best decisions. And um, I I'm pretty satisfied with the training that I got done because uh, personally, I'm not used to working out by myself. I'm not used to being the one that conducts the pace. And uh, I think in this off season or the season that we didn't have, I, I grew a lot on that perspective. You have been called the future of North American <laughs> distance running. You mentioned this, you signed a pro contract with Reebok after all kind of shoe companies were going after you. But when you're home, when you're in Toronto, do people even recognize you, Justin? You know, sometimes if I'm doing stuff within the running community, people will stop and talk to me for a while and I'm all for that. But uh, it's not like I'm walking down the street. I wasn't getting the Kawhi treatment. <laughs> <laughs> now, you are the most decorated runner in Syracuse University history. You helped deliver them a national championship. So I'm guessing in that town, though, in upstate New York, people do recognize you there. They do. In, in Syracuse, uh, honestly, they treat me like royalty over there. And, you know, I'm so proud and uh, to just be a part of such a great school, community, and Syracuse, you know, they mean a lot to me, and I've always gone back to visit, and, um, you know, they always have a special spot in my heart, and uh, I'm just really thankful to have had the opportunity to make those relationships over there. I want to ask you this, you know, I ran a little track when I was younger, and most kids, they want to run the one and the two. What got you into <laughs> distance running? It was in grade 10 gym class. I'll never forget, it was Mr. Chittle, if he's watching this. Shout out, Mr. Um, Chittle. Yeah, shout out to Mr. Chittle. And I'll never forget, I was in gym class, we got like our midterm grades or whatever, and I saw I was sitting at like a 68 or something in gym class. And um, I remember he told me, we had a serious conversation, he said, you know, I give marks based off of the effort that you're putting. And even though you're winning in gym class and you're scoring X amount of points, I can tell that you're kind of not putting your best foot forward. Not living and up your to your marks potential. That. Yeah. Exactly. I wasn't living up to my potential in gym class. And um, I, I told him, I said, you know, that I can't present this mark when I go home. Um, it's unacceptable. And how can I show you that I'm going to be showing my best, putting my best, best foot forward? And he was honest with me. He said, you know, there's not much left. We only have one unit left, which was running. <laughs> and uh, 
in grade 10, uh, there's an annual 5K that we run at St. Mike's. And moments for preparing for it, I would run at the front of the class. I'd make sure that, like, I'd, I'd almost be like, hey, Mr. Chittle, look at me. I'm at the front. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, later on in that year, I ended up beating the school's record, the grade 10 record for the 5K in gym class. And um, they asked me and my parents if I'd be willing to, uh, participate in track for what was left in the season, which was just, you know, season metros and offsa. And, um, it ended up working out and that's how I got started in running. You know what? Let, let's finish off with this. How much would it mean to you and your family to be able to put on that team Canada Jersey and represent this country on the Olympic stage? It would mean so much for me to put on that Jersey and it always does. It doesn't matter. Big event, small event, or even if I'm just wearing it for fun, just wearing, being able to have that Team Canada jersey and put it on and uh, represent our country on a world stage, it means the world. Every time I go to like a world championship race or any sort of event where multiple countries are being represented, I don't want to just represent myself in a great manner on the track, but off the track as well. Well, they say Canadians are nice and you are living up to that, Justin. <laughs> I know you're a big basketball <laughs> fan because we saw you heckling the other team. When you're sitting behind Coach uh -oh. Beheim at Syracuse and going crazy, yeah. I've seen you on TV doing that. I didn't that. know you guys got those games Oh, no, we, we watched the Qs. I also follow you on Twitter, so I know you are a huge Raptors fan. And I want to mm -hmm. know how your home t hometown team is going to do in these playoffs. Are we going back to back, buddy? We're going back to back. I, I, Drake already made a song about it, so yes. <laughs> it's only right that we live up to it. I think we're going to go back to back. Justin, thank you for your time. Good <laughs> luck in your future endeavors, man. You are tearing up that track, and we just see a, a wonderful career ahead of you. And tell mom I, I want some West Indian food. I'm coming <laughs> for it. After you get that Olympic medal, I want an invite to the party <laughs> and some of that food, okay? Party at my house in Vaughn when, when, when the Olympics happen. <laughs> thank you very much, Justin, man, and good luck, buddy. All right, thank you. I love ending the show on a happy high note. Remember his name, Justin Knight? Good looking, charming, good speaker. He's going to be a star. Thank you for joining us. We will see you back here tomorrow at 6. Stay safe out there, everybody, and have a great night.